Hello! On this PowerPoint, we're going to be talking about deve developmental research um, studies and how they are essentially identified within the community of psychology. So let's start with the collection techniques. There are three. The first is what we call descriptive studies. And this is information is gathered on subjects without manipulating them in any way. And that's the important thing. We're not manipulating the subjects. These kind of studies use questionnaires, surveys, we observe, and we collect what we call case study data. And this is information about individuals in great detail in order to make generalizations. Then we have manipulation experiments, and these are experiments that are performed whereby all variables, except for one, are controlled. And um, if you are not in class, you should watch the Milgram manipulation experiment video that I've posted on the learning management system. It's one of the most famous manipulation experiments, and it looks at how people are willing to essentially put away their moral values in the face of authority that tells them what to do. Now getting back to the manipulation experiments, the one variable they manipulate is called the treatment and this helps determine cause and effect or correlation. Third, we have naturalistic experiments and this is when the researcher acts solely as an observer and does as little as possible to disturb the environment. The researcher acts as a recorder of the results. So if you've ever seen uh, the movie Gorillas in the Mist, which is about Diane Fossey watching gorillas in their natural habitat, that's a very naturalistic experiment. Um, of course, that's also about animals and not humans. Uh, the downfall of this type of experiment is that it is impossible to meet the strict guidelines of a true scientific experiment. Because remember, with social sciences, and this is psychology, sociology, the sciences that look at human behavior, either individually or as a group, it's very difficult to um, engage in that kind of experiment in a moral, ethical way for the most part. So a lot of the time, um, you know, we rely on the first type or the second type of collection technique because at least then it's a true scientific experiment. All right, one of the most important things I want you to know is the concept of correlation. And this is the association between variables that is established through a statistical technique known as correlation. And this means that a statistical evaluation of how great the degree of association is between two variables, how they fluctuate. Do they move together or do they move apart at the same rate? A statistical measure that indicates the extent to which two or more variables fluctuate together. And this does not mean cause and effect. <clears throat> it's very difficult to ascertain cause and effect so in most studies what we're looking at is the level of correlation possible correlation ranges from positive one to negative one a zero correlation indicates that there is no relationship between the variables a correlation of negative one indicates a perfect negative correlation meaning that as one variable goes up the other goes down. So for example, if you start to exercise one hour a day, the likeliness, likelihood of this is that your weight will go down a little bit. A correlation of positive one indicates a perfect positive correlation, meaning that both variables move in the same direction together. So for example, if instead of exercising you decide that you need to have a chocolate milkshake every day, the correlation is going to demonstrate that your weight will probably increase. Another um, concept you should know is something called the time variable research studies. We have a one-time, one-group study, and this is carried out only once on a group of subjects, and it's not really valid for studying cause and effect. 
On the other hand, though, we have what's called a longitudinal study. And this is when researchers make several observations of the same individuals at two or more times in their lives. Now, the advantages, we can find lasting habits over the long term. We can trace those adult behaviors that have changed since early childhood. The disadvantages, very expensive. It's hard to maintain due to the availability of researchers and subjects. And changes in the environment can also distort the results. Now, one of the most famous longitudinal study that didn't really turn out, um, didn't begin as a longitudinal study, is a documentary series called 7-Up. 1964, a filmmaker was interested in studying the socioeconomic ladder of England, and they were interviewing 14 different children to see that is there the possibility that these kids can break out of the socioeconomic status they're in. So they interview some kids from an orphanage, they in interview kids who are from working class families, from middle class families, from upper class families. And their original intent was to examine whether or not these kids who were born, for example, poor, could they become rich? Or could the rich kids lose everything and become poor? Now, what they did is every seven years, they went back and they filmed interviews with these 14 children. So they interviewed them at 7, 14, 21, 28, 35, 42, 49, and most recently 56. But by the time they were 21, it was pretty obvious that the socioeconomic aspect was just a small tip of the iceberg. What they were truly doing is reflecting to a certain extent, what Erickson is saying is that our lives are a series of crises and how we overcome those crises allow us to manage the rest of our lives. And as a consequence to this, this series has taken on a life of its own. It is one of the most important video documents ever created, um, whether for you know just straight documentary entertainment, you can watch it on Netflix, you can watch it on YouTube, and it's also used in most colleges where we discuss this kind of human development. I highly recommend watching it. It will take you about 20 hours to watch all of the interviews, but it is one of the most brilliant pieces of documentary filmmaking ever made. So, different kinds of research studies. We have cross-sectional studies, and this compare groups of individuals of various ages at the same time to investigate the, age, the effects of aging. So, what we're looking at is each age cohort has different experiences during their development. So, when I was a teenager in the 1980s, that's going to be much different than your experience being a teenager, whether it was in the 90s, the aughts, or in the last four years. Another option is the sequential study, otherwise known um, longitudinal cross-sectional studies. And this study is done at several times with the same groups of individuals. So a lot of times you'll see um, their, uh, researchers investigate, for example, um, relationships, and they'll look at couples who have been together, and they may um, identify first five years of marriage, second five years of marriage, third five years of marriage, so on and so forth. But they're looking at the exact same people. Um, and again, one of the issues is it is very hard to keep track of people, so it can be challenging.